but Dane was saying about getting an example of some reading. Mm. So I, I, I was thinking about what to what to read, and I thought, well, as I've been saying to you, you know, you've got to promote yourself all the time, and you do these days. That the, the days again of the of the writer who would sit starving in their garret and say, "Oh, it's not my job. Leave it to the other people." The hoi polloi can't do it anymore. You've got to be promoting yourself all the time. Um, I'm going to do that now because what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little bit of a reading from my next novel. Now, the, this this is a trilogy. The first one was called A Murder to Die For. The second one was called The Diabolical Club. And the third one, the front cover, the title looks like it's the word cock rings. <laughs> but it's actually pronounced Corring. It's a it's a it's an old English name which is pronounced Corring but looks like Cockering. Um, and it's the third one in the trilogy, and it's basically a feud between an aristocratic brother and sister, which gets ridiculously farcical. It's another comedy. All my novels have been comedies. And um, and it also involves a geriatric circus. And the bit I'm going to read you... Yeah, seriously, a geriatric circus, which, again, was inspired by actually going and seeing a circus, uh, strange enough, in France at the time, where all the performers were really old and chatting to some of the people involved, they said, well, they will not retire. The circus is their life. It's all they know. They will not retire. They will not go away. Um, the circus, I was quite upset about it. So I thought there's a plot there. Just the idea of aged circus performers who don't know anything else, but just keep carrying on, even though circuses are dying a death. I thought this is great. So this is where they first get introduced in the book. Um, basically, we're at a level crossing. The barriers have gone down. We're waiting for a train to go through. And waiting at the barriers is uh, a retired major, army major, in his uh, Land Rover. The local vicar uh, and, uh, and a dog walker has just come along uh, called Mr. Ostrich, who's, um, it sounds like ostrich, but it's ostrich. Um, and also the local special constable. Uh, Constable Pews has come along as well just to see what's going on just as the circus trucks have pulled up for the first time and because they know they're going to be waiting there for a while and they've been on the road for a bit the circus truck decides to let the horses out for a, a little bit of a leg stretch and this is what happens <coughs> gentlemen may I present the daughters of Epona said Ben Ellis he's the circus owner good lord said the major a few curious onlookers had now emerged from the handful of cottages that constituted the hamlet of Snipton among them were Special Constable Arthur Pews, fresh from the warm bed of recently widowed Mrs. Beryl Tiggs. He fastened his tunic round his ample belly and walked towards the crossing, offering a loud and unconvincing, well, thank you very much for helping me with my inquiries, Mrs. Tiggs, for the benefit of the neighbours. The neighbours were not especially convinced, as Mrs. Tiggs, Mrs. Tiggs had been helping Constable Pews with his inquiries regularly and noisily for at least two nights a week ever since her husband had died ten months earlier, and possibly before. Pews pulled in his stomach and pushed his shoulders back in an effort to look more imposing. He quickly scanned the circus vehicles and hoped to God that no offences were being committed and they'd be forced to do some police work. I'll skip a bit here. Uh, yeah, Mr. Ostrich has now come along with his dog, who's a very hyperactive Highland Terrier called Taffy, um, uh, whose self-imposed strangulation was now causing his eyes to bulge like bloodshot marbles because the dog's pulling on his leaves. Um, but, 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 but with the possible exception of the uh, circus truck driver, who was asleep at the wheel and snoring loudly, and I'm going to skip this bit as well. Here we go. Right, this is the bit where the train goes through the crossing now, and this is where the, the action ramps up. Anything said after that was lost as the anticipated Paddington to Hoddenford Express thundered through the crossing, sounding its horn and importantly announcing its presence. It delighted everyone except for the crazed Taffy, who achieved startling new levels of rage. With one mighty tug, the terrier pulled the leash free of Gerald Ostrich's hand and sank his teeth into the Reverend's leg. The Reverend shouted an alarm, which caused the horse nearest to him to re rear up and whinny in fright. Its rider, who had been in the process of ex executing a party de deux with one of her fellow daughters of Epona, was thrown into the air and landed heavily upon the roof of the Reverend's beloved Morris. The impact burst her already straining corset, and her bosom exploded into view like twin airbags. The horse angrily kicked the front of the car and bolted. The dazed ballerina slowly slid down the car's windscreen onto the bonnet, coming to rest on her back and with one leg draped over each headlight, looking like a woman about to give birth and expecting something the size of a pig. A startled Constable Pews, his eyes fairly popping out of his head at the sight of the semi-conscious 
rider's frilly underwear and football-sized breasts immediately rushed across to render what first hate he could remember. As he crushed his lips to the horsewoman's in an attempt at artificial respiration, she regained consciousness. Finding herself half-naked and apparently being French kissed by some pervert in a police uniform, she naturally assumed the worst and began screaming as loudly and as piercingly as her unfortunate position would allow. The other horsewomen responded and Pews suddenly found himself reeling from a hail of horsewhips. He curled into a ball on the ground and attempted to call for assistance, but his radio was dashed from his hand and trodden, under, trodden underfoot by one of the horses. Professor Ostrich, who witnessed, witnessed the entire incident, steeled himself for action. It was his public duty, as an occasional lay magistrate, he reasoned, to go to the rescue of the beleaguered constable, and he intended to do so as soon as he'd captured his now berserk dog. He found it scrabbling furiously at the driver's door of the Morris Traveller, where the Reverend and Ben Ellis had taken refuge from its jaws. <coughs> After much pulling and manoeuvring, he got the animal to the rear of the car, where he tethered its leash to the bumper. He then waded into the fracas, attempting to wrestle a riding crop from one of the daughters of Epona and getting a ballet shoe in the testicles for his, effort, for his efforts. It just goes on like this. The dog gets killed, someone else gets trampled. Um, the idea was just to build up a huge slapstick moment to introduce the circus and the chaos that follows them wherever they go, because I'm then going to introduce this chaotic circus into a quiet rural idyll where these two aristocratic brothers and sisters are arguing over selling off the properties in the village they own. So yeah, there you go. That That's a little bit of uh, advanced on a book, which I think will be out June, July. I can't remember now. It got put back because of COVID. It should have been out last autumn. But uh, that gave us a chance to have another run at it with the editor. So I'm quite happy, really, because I found a couple of mistakes. <laughs>